and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand this. I pray that you'd help each of us develop this most important relationship that we have uh, each individually with thee. Help us to understand this idea and possibly be able to uh, prepare and do something about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 2 Kings 2, when you kind of skim down through there, you'll see that Elijah and Elisha are mentioned. And uh, Elijah would be the mentor of Elisha. And the way I remember them is they're in alphabetical order. And so you have Elisha, then Eli- or Elijah, then Elisha. And I want to look at this as far as uh, like a practical thing or instructional thing. And so in uh, Elijah is going to cheat the undertaker. And he's going to get the upper taker. And that would be a pretty good ride. So I wonder what happened with his life insurance policy when he... They probably, didn't, they probably had a clause in there. No upper takers here. <laughs> so 2 Kings 2, it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So they're going from place to place. Okay, uh, Elisha, if you go back to chapter 19, I think it is, after the depression of Elijah, uh, when the Lord said, I'm going to give you a replacement. Yeah, at the end of 1 Kings 19, he was plowing in the back 40, and that's when Elijah chose him. So in 2 Kings 2, now Elisha is still hanging around. And evidently the Lord told Elijah that he's going to be, uh, he's going to be whisked away. And he evidently told Elisha also secretly. And then in verse 2, Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. So I don't know if it was a test. I don't know why Elijah did that. And Bethel is a very significant place. We're going to kind of focus a little bit on Bethel today. Beth is house, E-L. The E-L at the end is the short form of Elohim. So that would be Beth is house. So this would be defined to be house of God. So like Daniel, okay, Ezekiel, their names have God in their name. The two Named angels are Michael and Gabriel. Both of them have the E-L at the end. And that's God's name in their name. Now in verse 3 it says, The sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha. So this is like a small body of uh, students that are studying uh, the ways of the prophets, possibly to become a, an individual prophet. And they were at that location, Bethel. Okay, and then said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. So the Lord uh, let several people know about this event. And so in uh, verse 4, Elijah does the same thing to Elisha. He's heading to Jericho, got a busy day. And he's telling Elisha to stick around. And in verse 5, the sons of the prophets at Jericho also knew about this event. They had foreknowledge of it. So, And then Elijah did the same thing to Elisha. I want you to stick around. And Elisha uh, was persistent and stayed with him. And then in verse 7, and 50 of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off that they stood by Jordan. So they want to see the action. They said, they'd heard about this. They said, well, I'd like to see that in action. So now Elijah is going to go to the Jordan River. And in verse 8, and Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together. So this is a cloth, outward cloth, and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. And 
I see a kidnapping taking place right now. A kidnapping. Yeah, there she is, a kidnapper. So, <clears throat> so uh, this would be quite an event. I mean, and you imagine somebody down to Kankakee River. Of course, it's not moving as fast as Jordan. And somebody whacks it, and then all of a sudden, one water there, one water there, and then they walk across. They didn't like bridges, I guess. I guess on a bridge, you have a 99.9% chance to get from one side to the other. So in order to prevent that, you walk down into the water and go to the other side because that 0.1%, and of course, that's, you know, the vaccination is 99.95% recovery. But, <clears throat> oh well. Okay, so uh, they saw the action and they thought that was pretty good. And verse 9, it says, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, because before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And that was a tough one. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou... See me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire. So this chariot was fire-like, and horses of fire, and they parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. He was snatched away picture of the pre-tribulation rapture. This would probably be the post-tribulation rapture for the Jews. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. So that whirlwind whipped it out. And so there it was in the ground, and he went and picked it up. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. So now Elisha <clears throat> received his first personal miracle. So eventually, if you kind of study these two guys, some have done that and thought that Elijah had eight miracles and Elisha had 16 miracles. One of them occurred after his death. He might have been counting and say, and then one took place after his death. So then it says, and when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Okay, so practically what these two display <coughs> is a first and second generation. Okay, first generation believers. So I'll lay the kind of the definition what I'm looking at. A first generation believer and a second generation believer. A second generation can uh, rely or at first receive blessings from the first generation where Elisha said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? So the second generation can receive some benefits from the first, but eventually it's got to be Where's the Lord God of Elisha? And that's where it eventually came. Okay, first generation believer. Now, doctrinally, the entire church age is one generation. Okay, doctrinally. But practically, okay, when a person is raised in a certain religious uh, faith, church, whatever it is, if they're more diligent, if this faith claims to come from the Bible and they do the unusual and actually read the Bible, and when they start reading the Bible, they find out that their church or their faith doesn't seem to hold in line with some things they're reading in the Bible. And that causes more of a curious, and maybe they begin to ask questions and the leadership says, you just be quiet. And don't rock the boat. But this person continues to study. And maybe they get saved as a result of that. Okay, that's 
first generation believer. Now, in John chapter 1, this is an example in John 1 where you have uh, Jesus and his ministry. You have John the Baptist. John the Baptist had some disciples. One of those disciples was named Andrew. He came across Jesus and he became, in essence, a first generation believer in Jesus. And so what did he do? He thought of his family. So he immediately bolted to his brother. That happened to be Peter. Told him about this. And Peter also became first generation believer in Jesus. And then there's another guy named Philip. He, in that same chapter of John 1, believed in Jesus. And he thought of Nathaniel. Now, I don't know if Nathaniel was his brother or friend. It doesn't say but let's make him a friend. So he immediately went to his friend and said, hey, you got to come see this guy. And then Nathaniel becomes first generation believer. Now, that's that's the uh, highest. Uh, what do you say? Efficiency in witnessing when family wins family or a friend, a friend wins friend. That's the highest efficiently f- efficiency where if you go cold turkey, you got to eventually you kind of develop a relationship depending on the culture. Like in China, my sister says it takes two years just to develop that relationship. Two years of witnessing, dealing with that, and other cultures, it's longer. Okay, but even at that, you have first generation. Like in my family, we were raised Dutch Reformed. My dad was raised Dutch Reformed. And he began reading. He noticed things that weren't in line. Okay, and, 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 he, and he got saved, and I got saved really about the same time. So in essence, we're kind of both first generation. And then my mother, in 1969, she walked the aisle in the Bible church up here. And I, I dutifully walked behind her <laughs> and went in the same room. But I pretty much at that time knew I was already saved. But, you know, you just kind of do that. And so... That way, then my children become second generation. Now, in Janet's family, uh, her parents were Mennonite. They became first generation. And then Janet and her siblings became second generation. And then their kids will be third generation. Okay, and so this is kind of how this is lined up as um, I'm laying this out. Now, the second generation believers can survive for a time on the experience of the first generation. But eventually, the second generation needs to make it personal. And in essence, they become first generation. And the third generation believers need to follow the same pattern. It's like with the first generation, the second generation, we could put them on a bicycle and have training wheels. Eventually... They need to take the training wheels off. When I see those Harleys, you know, three-wheeler Harleys, I kind of look at them still on their training wheels. <laughs> you know, get rid of that, you know, all that. That's kind of how I view it, you know. But I still wave at them, you know. Motorcycle guy, we have a camaraderie. We wave at each other each time, you know. I'm, I don't wave at mopeds. That, that doesn't count, so. And so that's how that works. Okay, so now... Elijah would be the first generation. Elisha would be the second. Okay, Moses would be first generation. Joshua becomes second. And sadly, there was no third. It went downhill after that. Okay, now eventually Joshua, you see, will have his own miracles, his own signs. Because he, in essence, it's funny, when Moses died and Joshua, the Lord wants Joshua to take over, the Lord just flat out says, oh, by the way, Moses is dead. In other words, training wheels are off. I want you to lead here. Okay, in Samuel... You have Eli, if you remember that guy, and he had a couple raunchy boys, so second generation didn't pan out. Samuel becomes second generation, but his boys didn't pan out. So third generation went by the wayside. Okay, Paul mentioned to Timothy about his mother and grandmother, Eunice and Lois. So they would have been... The mother, grandmother would have been first generation, and the mother second generation, and Timothy would be third generation. 
And Paul would be first generation and Timothy would have been his second generation as far as that goes. But eventually Timothy developed his own personal relationship with the Lord. Now, most people, if you do talk to people about their faith or the religion, if you just talk to them and have them explain why they do certain things, most of them really don't understand it. They just stay within the church they grew up with. And if you talk to a Catholic about their faith, I know more about their faith than they know about their faith. If you talk to the Mormon kids, do they know about their faith? I doubt it. Uh, If you would tell a Mormon kid, did you know that your faith teaches that Jesus and the devil are brothers? And they both offered a plan of salvation to God and God accepted Jesus and rejected Satan's plan of salvation. And the curse put on Satan, Jesus, his children became fair-skinned children and Satan's children became dark-skinned children. It's kind of hard to have a basketball, a good basketball team in Utah if you just follow that doctrine. Do they know that? Most of them don't know that. Do they know that If they apostatize from the Mormon faith, the blood atonement doctrine is that they got to shed the blood of the apostate in order to save their soul. Do they know that? Do Catholics know the, the sacraments of their faith? Do they know that if they marry outside of their faith, they're doomed to hell? Do they know that? I mean, most of the time people don't know what they believe. They don't know what their church believes. That's just kind of common. Okay, and most are unable to reasonably explain their belief why they believe. And sadly, that's, that's to the fault of them. If they would begin to research what their church teaches and then read the Bible, they would discover there's some problems here. And hopefully they would see their need of Jesus Christ and become first generation believer. And so I want to give you some thoughts about this most vital priority of every one of us is your personal relationship with the Lord. And we'll go back to the Old Testament and and look at a three generation thing. Okay, Abraham would be a first generation believer. If you go back to Genesis 12, you want to kind of look at that. He has a dream. He gets a direct message from God. And then in Genesis 12, verse 7 and 8, he establishes an altar, and it's called at Bethel. That's at Bethel that we read with Elijah. Bethel, the house of God, that's where that originated in Genesis 12 with Abraham. Okay, now, then Abraham, first generation, and Abraham is called a friend of God twice in the Bible. Well, he has a son, Isaac. Abraham had this promise that's going to go down the lineage of Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Now, where did Isaac get his personal up, you know, his where he takes initially from Abraham, but then Elijah or then uh, Abraham had offered up Isaac as a sacrifice. That's where Isaac had his experience right there. Now, okay, now, whatever age you want to put on him, put him 12, put him a teenager. Personally, I kind of lean to 33. But even at that, Isaac obviously had to voluntarily choose to be sacrificed. I mean, I kind of highly doubt it happened like this, where Isaac and Abraham's going over there and he's building this altar. And Isaac said, what you got the rope for, Dad? Oh, well, don't worry about that. What's that knife for? Oh, no, just come over here. Twelve years old, don't you think a twelve-year-old kid could outrun a hundred and twelve-year-old man? Don't you think a teenager could overpower his dad? I do believe Isaac voluntarily submitted to that sacrifice. I believe that Isaac and Abraham, now it says Abraham thought this, that he was going to have to do the sacrifice and then God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. Okay, and then they're going to come back down the mountain. Well, God intervened and said, oh, by the way, we're going to skip that part. But I think that's where Isaac had his personal faith in the Lord. 
He relied upon his relationship with his dad, but now it became personal. Now the third generation is Jacob. Now Jacob was a rascal. He was a conniver. And when you read his story, you'll see what a conniving guy, all about self. <clears throat> but then something happened to him where he had a pretty big test. And then he had his Bethel experience. Had that big wrestling thing. And then he had a Bethel. But what Jacob did is he upped it from Bethel to El Bethel. So if, with Abraham, it was the house of God. With Isaac, it was the house of God. With Jacob, you know, the way the third generation can survive is they got to up it to the God of the house of God. The El Bethel. That's that third generation. And then you see that Jacob's name is then changed to Israel. The E-L at the end is where they took God's name on their name. Okay, another character in Abraham's life was his servant, Eliezer. Eliezer would be second generation believer, where Abraham wanted Isaac to get a bride for Isaac. So he, he gave this responsibility, Eliezer. And when you read that story in Genesis 24, Eliezer prays a prayer and he says, By the Lord God of Abraham, my master. So he is relying on the training wheels from his master. So that can be at the start, but then when God answered Eliezer's prayer, now it's the Lord God of Eliezer. He gets his personal answer. See, that's the way we follow with Abraham. Now, if you would go to John 15. Now, with the apostles, okay, in, in one way they become first generation believers, but yet Jesus is technically the first generation, and the apostles become second. Now, in John 15, we've been going through the gospel according to John on Thursdays. <clears throat> now, in John 14 and following, in John 13, you have the Lord's, the Last Supper, <clears throat> and uh, the betrayal and all that stuff. And so the, George, the Lord is getting ready to take the training wheels off the bike of the apostles. Okay, now this occurs like in sports also. It occurs in, uh, in many fields of life, occupations. Okay, in sports, maybe the dad really likes the sport. Maybe he's the first. And then he wants his boys to like the sport. And, and if they don't like it, he wants to force on them. And then they get burned out of it. And they don't want anything to do with that sport. So the same the same generational thing occurs in sports and occupations. Okay, in this game, we're limiting it to the Bible. In John 15, the Lord knows that the apostles are immediately going to go through a tragic thing. They're going to flee him. They're going to run away. They're going to go through a tough time. And he also, he might be preparing them for the tribulation at the same time. They might be coming back in the trip. So in John 14, you'll see that he introduces to them the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> in John 15, they bring it up again. And in John 16, he mentions the Holy Ghost again. And then he mentions about them uh, being hauled into synagogues. And, and somebody are going to actually think they do God's service by killing them. So that's why I kind of think that goes into the tribulation. But even at, in John 15, he is going to raise... Their relationship from a servant, second generation, to a first generation friend. In John 15, 13. Okay, in John 15, 13, you'll see there where he says this. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then he says, ye are my friends. So he, he's, the relationship, he's taking the training wheels off. He says, okay, now you're going to walk yourself. And of course, we're going to, it's just like a little kid learning to walk. Okay, that they're going to fall several times and we're going to fall, make mistakes. And this, this new generation, first generation, ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. 
Now that's, that's that relationship Abraham had, that first generation, where Jesus is not only one savior, but one's friend. And this is the highest goal in a marriage. And when you go to Song of Solomon 5, verse 16, where Solomon describes there, my beloved and my friend. That'd be that, that goal there. Okay, so now here we got the apostles portrayed now to be first generation believers. They're stepping up from second to first, having their own. And I would dare say it's like any and all of us. A lot of times people are always pointing their finger, so and so needs this, so and so needs that. Uh, I think we need to be looking at ourselves more than anything. Okay, in sports, it's so easy, the audience, you know, always correcting the referee. You know, always doing that. Okay, like, okay, you can see better 200 feet up in the, in the, in the stands, you know, at, you know, in the seventh inning where you're drunk and you, and, and you can see if it's a striker ball better than the guy behind the plate. Right. Okay, but th- it's easy to, you know, these, these sports analysis, especially the ones that never played a game, it's like, oh, like, you know how to play. Why did you throw that pass at that time, corner? Well, if you had a 300-pound gorilla coming at you, you'd be doing something, too. I mean, it's just like, you know, people don't think about those things. And so, uh, the best athlete is the most critical athlete of himself. The best athlete is good, better, best, never let it rest until your good becomes better and your better becomes best. And you know, the Lord Jesus wants the best of the best in all our lives. That's what he wants. Philippians 1, 6, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And if we develop this friendship, we will see that the Lord wants our best, of the best. And if we work with him, we might be surprised what he can do. A church should be filled with friends who desire and seek the best of each other. That's an ideal church. It's not, I don't like so and so over there, I don't like so and so over there. We desire the best. In Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius, who was a good man, a religious man, but a lost man, he received an answer to prayer from God as a lost man. And the Lord said, I'm going to send somebody to tell you some things you need to hear. And he called his kin and near friends. He called them near friends. That's an unusual friend, a near friend. That's a friend he could trust. In Acts 10, 24, got them together and he, they heard, and they all became first generation believers. Okay, now, uh, the friend in the Bible can be used uh, two different ways, as in a real friend or as in a fake friend. Daniel had three friends that were real friends. Job had three friends that were friends like them who need enemies. Okay, and so a real friend, Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, and a man sharpeneth the counsel of his countenance of his friend. That's a friend. Dan, uh, the psalmist put it this way, My companions are them that fear thee. That's the good kind of friends. That's the kind of friends that Daniel had. They were companions, ones that feared the Lord. It is wise to surround yourself with people who want you to become better. They have your best interest at heart. A friend wants the best of the best for you. How can you tell that? You can tell a friend bad news and they will listen without derailing the conversation. Okay, if you tell a friend bad news, he is actually sad and he will listen. Romans 12, 15, I would say, puts it in one verse. You rejoice with those who rejoice and you weep with those who weep. 
A friend can empathize with the pain. Not sympathize. Empathize with the pain. A friend will not secretly be happy that you got knocked off your pedestal. A friend will not tell you about, after you told them their sad story, a friend wants to one-up you. Well, I had this happen to me. I had a paper cut and their conditioner went out. Okay, they're going to try to one-up you. A friend doesn't try to top the horrible thing that happened to you with a worse thing that happened to him. A friend has patience that will listen. He's not secretly gloating about the fact that catastrophe finally befell you. He will actually hurt for you. A friend, if you tell him good news, he is truly happy. Okay, he will not tell you something that better happened to him. Well, you got to come see my new car that I got. Well, it's not new, but it's new for me. And then say, well, I want you to come see my Lamborghini. You know, no, a friend will rejoice in your joy. He's not bitter and resentful underground by saying horrible things behind your back. Or... Worse, with condescension in front of you. Condescending. You know, people that can't talk down to you. When I, took that, when I was in that debate with that water dog, he would condescend. David, David, he would say. And after hearing that several times toward the end of the debate, I said, you know, that's a scriptural thing, what you're doing, David, David. Because seven times in the Bible, someone's name is said twice. Mac, Mac. You know, condescending, <clears throat> you know, and so I, you just kind of laugh about it. A, a friend, when you tell him good news, he wants to celebrate with you. That's what a friend does. You see, uh, a friend will hold you to a high standard. That's what a friend will do. In 1 Corinthians 4, 9, a lot of times... People are uh, kind of afraid to witness because they know that if I witness, oh, it's cats out of the bag. They know I'm a Christian and the world's going to hold a Christian to a high standard. That's good for us. But it's a funny thing. When they hold a Christian to a high standard, just turn around and say, well, I'm glad to see that you're really concerned about high standards of the Christian life. What about putting that in your life? You know, where they can pick and choose on that. And Paul said we have made a spectacle to the world. Yes, and we are made a spectacle to the world, and that's good for us. That's good for us in those things. A friend may seek to correct you when you're wrong by asking questions to try to get you to think. Stop and think about this. Think it through. Please think it through. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just worried for you. Please think this through. A person needs to shy away from people who are going to drag you down. Now, if people around you are not on the side of what is good for you, then I would consider walking away. It is best for him because if you put up with his behavior, you're enabling his behavior and you're not helping them. So you're confirming to them that it's okay for you to mistreat people without saying something. You're building boundaries. I mean, is this how you normally talk to people? Your condescension? I, that's what I'm getting from this. I, I'm interpreting this. Is this a normal behavior for you? I mean, people really don't like, do you like it when people talk that way to you? Then why do you talk that way to others? You see, if, if someone, let's say, if, if someone's, let's say, family that you, you, know, you just can't, boom, get away from, if they're aiming down hard, and they're aiming down hard, and they're bitter about it, and they want to produce misery, a person, there's a time you need to detach yourself from that. Okay, why is that? You can't, uh, okay, for example, it's like in a lifeguard. Okay, a guy's a lifeguard. Someone's out there screaming, yelling, panicking. He does his job. He swims out there. But if they're panicking, he's got to pause Lay on his back, kind of dog paddle, put his feet out in front of him, try to get them to calm down, 
And if they reach out to grab him, he's got to kick them away. Because what's worse than one person drowning, two people drowning. And until that person is calm enough that he can put his arm around their neck and shoulder and then bring them in. And this is what we need to do for folks sometimes. Is we don't want to go down with the ship. You know, go down to going down. And this is a wise way. to. The panicked person seeks to grab the lifeguard and then both of them will drown. If a loved one continues a downward path, we can give some words and ask questions. But if they're going to scorn those words and says in Matthew 7 that we are not to cast our pearl before swine. We're degrading our advice. Words of advice are treated with contempt. We need to stop because we're demeaning the words of advice. And if the loved one is determined to go down, don't go down with them. The prodigal had to come to himself. He had to come to himself. And when he came to himself and realized his destructive nature, then dad's got his arms out to help him out. You see... One can now a person can spiral down with them, and both of you complain about how life is unfair. That's a choice, too. But what choice is that? You see, and this is the level the Lord wants us to have is to be a friend of Him because He is a friend to sinners. Now, this Bethel, it's interesting when you follow the progression of Bethel in the Bible, you have it in Genesis 12. Where Bethel with Abraham, he sought friendship with God. But then Bethel shows up way in 1 Kings 13. After Israel splits the ten northern, the two southern. And Jeroboam, the northern, Rehoboam, the southern. And Jeroboam was afraid that the Jews were going to go down to the temple and then want to stay in Judah. So he made a fake religion up there and it was called Bethel. Just like Genesis chapter 12. The Bethel of Abraham sought friendship with God. The Bethel of Jeroboam sought self-adoration and self-gain. And Bethel began with God but degenerated toward man. In actuality, Satan. And that's when Amos steps in. When you read about Amos, he brings up Bethel and how corrupt it is. You see, Amos warned against Bethel then. He was trying to get Bethel to get back to Genesis 12. And you see this in institutions, okay? If you go up to Chicago, there's a place called Moody Bible Institute. Originally, it's called Chicago Bible Institute when D.L. Moody was alive. First generation believer. After he passed off the scene, then they changed it to Moody Bible Institute because Chicago Bible Institute just didn't seem to have the draw. So the second generation can live off the first when they call it Moody Bible Institute. If D.L. Moody came back today and became president of Moody Bible Institute, he would have fired about 99% of them. Because third generation is gone. Fourth generation, just worse than the third. And you see, each generation, we can survive on the training wheels of generation one, but eventually the training wheels got to come off. And we've got to develop our own personal relationship with the Lord. And Bethel, the ideal beginning of Bethel is to seek that friendship with God. And that's what each and every one of us have to do. And then we're a friend to each other, trying to develop each other's friendship with our God. That's really what church is about. You know, a lot of times church is, I want to show up down south, it's ladies, I want to show off my new hat. You know, I don't know if they still do that, but down south it's like that, or see how good I am. No, we're all, we're all pieces of dirt. Animated dirt balls. Okay, and we're just each trying to develop our friendship with Jesus Christ. Praying for each other. Okay, let's pray with that. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to understand this first, second, third generation idea. Where Abraham... <clears throat> Was an example to Isaac, and Isaac developed his relationship. And then eventually, eventually J- Jacob developed his. Boy, he was a rascal for a long time. But eventually, he did develop that friendship. And then Elisha, uh, amazing, amazing life. 
And uh, eventually he, it was now, where's the Lord God of Elisha? In each of us, where's the Lord God of fill in the blank? Each and every one of us. Where we have our personal relationship with, with thee, our personal victories with thee. Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand this idea that we might develop our friendship with thee. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.